In God's providence, if you, uh, sorry, we got you. In God's providence, if you scratch under the surface a little bit of this message, you may find some applications that are relevant to our particular time as well. But we're going to be looking at the story of Joseph. It's one of the most beautiful, richest uh, passages, I think, in all of literature. Uh, the drama, the intrigue, the pain, the recovery, the, the turnaround, the ironies. Uh, it's just a tremendously rich story, and it's blessed me a great deal. And I want you to understand at the outset that the things that we're going to be looking at this morning, I want you to marvel with me in this miracle that's occurred in the life of Joseph. And it may not be the miracle you're thinking of right now, by the way. Um, but these, these are things that I aspire to. This passage has blessed me because I struggle with the very things that we're going to be talking about this morning. And so I invite you to look into the scriptures with me and get what encouragement um, and conviction as necessary, what we can gather from the scriptures here as we look at these things. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, merciful Father, we thank you for this time um, to gather as many as are here and online as well. We thank you for your spirit who guides us and illumines our hearts. And I pray that your spirit would be here this morning, that you would illumine every heart and that you would bring a word of encouragement and a word of light to each heart that needs it this morning. Pray that you would give me clarity and control as I bring this word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know the story of Joseph, but for those who may not be as familiar with it, let me give a quick uh, recap here. Joseph was one of the patriarchs in the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, also Israel was his name, and then Joseph. Joseph was the favorite son of 12 brothers, and he had that famous coat of many colors, which his father made for him as a sign of his great love for Joseph. Joseph also was a dreamer. He had uh, several important dreams. One of those dreams, there were 12 sheaves of grain in the field. Remember, Joseph had 11 brothers, and 11 of those sheaves were bowing down to Joseph's sheaf of grain. Joseph uh, hadn't read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and so he shared this dream with his brothers, <laughs> and his brothers were not necessarily impressed. They said, will you really rule over us? Will we really bow down to you? I love the ironies. <laughs> I love the ironies. Well, so they wanted to kill him, in fact. They hated him so much. So one day, Jacob sent Joseph out to check on his brothers in the fields, and they plotted to kill him. But his older brother Reuben had a plan to rescue him. But while Reuben was away, Judah came up with a more profitable plan to sell him for 20 shekels of silver to the Midianite traders, traders that were coming by. So Joseph was taken to Egypt as a slave, and his brothers fake his death by soaking his coat of many colors in blood. Meanwhile, Joseph serves in the house of a man named Potiphar, and God blesses all that he does. But Mrs. Potiphar tries to seduce Joseph. Joseph flees from her. But when Mr. Potiphar gets home, she falsely accuses him, and he's thrown into prison. Again, in prison, we read that the Lord blessed Joseph, and the, prisoner, uh, the prison keeper put all in his charge. After a while, Joseph gets some new cellmates in prison, the king's baker and the cupbearer, and they have dreams. Joseph interprets their dreams correctly and says, the one will be hanged, the other will be restored to his office. And in a few days' time, that's exactly what takes place. Joseph had hoped that the cupbearer who was restored would remember him when he got back to the king and say, hey, there's this Hebrew who, who interprets dreams. He might be valuable for the kingdom. But that didn't happen. He was forgotten for another two years until Pharaoh himself had a dream. In Pharaoh's dream, then the cupbearer remembers his faults before the king and says, O king, I do now remember my faults before you. I was in prison. You know, while I was in prison, I met this young Hebrew who could interpret dreams. So they called Joseph from prison 
And Joseph interprets the dream that there will be five years, seven years, sorry, of great plenty, followed by seven years of great famine in the land of Egypt. And the king says, who is so wise as this man in whom the Spirit of God is? Let's appoint him to oversee the collection and distribution of food for these years of feast and famine that are coming. And so Joseph is elevated from prison to second in the command in the kingdom of Egypt. The famine begins, and Joseph's brothers get hungry. They come from the land of Canaan to buy grain. Joseph recognizes them, but they do not recognize him. And Joseph tests them. He says, you are spies. In order to prove that you're not spies, I want you to go back and get your youngest brother, because he'd asked them about their family. So Simeon stays in prison while all the others go back. And Jacob, upon hearing this, <clears throat> loses faith. Now Jacob, it might have been difficult to be Jacob's son, because Jacob had said to his, uh, his sons in the first place, why do you stand looking at each other? Go to Egypt and buy some grain. <laughs> and then having done that, they come back and Jacob says, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. As an aside here, we can note, because we, can note, we know the rest of the story, that Jacob at this point in time is wrong about his past, wrong about the present, and wrong about the future. Whenever you hear yourself saying, all these things are against me, it's time for a faith check. Joseph was walking, Jacob, sorry, was walking by sight and not by faith at this point. But a little while later, the hungrier they get, he seems to have a little spark of faith again. The, his sons convince him that they need to go back to see the man in Egypt. And so Jacob tells them at that time in chapter 43, 14, he says, May God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man, so that he will release to you your other brother in Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. There's perhaps a note of stoicism or resignation there. Well, the brothers return with Benjamin, and then the unexpected happens. Joseph invites them to dinner. But the brothers suspect the worst. So in 43.18, he says, Now the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, It is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time that we were being brought in that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for slaves with our donkeys. Now, it's a bit illogical, their fear, because if, if Joseph had wanted to do that, he could have done that the first time they were there. Why invite them to dinner to do that? Joseph's intentions were pure, but their fears and their guilty conscience lead them to suspect evil on his part. They are not yet believing in the goodness of God. Joseph's steward, though, meets them with comfort. In 43.23, he says, Be at ease. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Now, where did he learn such words of comfort, this Egyptian pagan? And how would he have known who their God was much less the God of their father. Had Joseph told the steward that they were his brothers? Had Joseph told them how he got into Egypt? A lot of interesting questions. We don't really know the answers. They have a most interesting dinner in which they're seated in birth order, which Joseph could not possibly have known unless he were part of the family. And Benjamin received five times as much as everybody else. Teenage boys dream dinner, right? Joseph, upon seeing Benjamin, his younger brother, has to excuse himself because he's overcome with emotion. He comes back, he sends them off, but then he tells the steward to put his silver cup in their sacks, in the sack of Benjamin, specifically. And so the steward does that, and then he chases after them and says, why have you stolen the silver cup of my master? And the men are mortified. They say to him, Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servants to do such a thing. 
Behold, the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks we have brought to you from the land of Canaan. How could we then steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomever of your servants it is found, let him die, and we will also be my Lord's slaves. Now I wonder if Jacob, Father Jacob had ever told them about when he left Uncle Laban's house with laden camels and Rachel had stolen the silver idol out of Laban's house. unbeknownst to Jacob. Because when Laban came, Jacob said exactly the same thing to Laban. With whomever it is found, let them die. Being unaware that it was in Rachel's sack. So you might think that Jacob might have given his son instructions at some point saying, listen, guys, when you go into a city, you leave the city, somebody chases after you, they says you've stolen something. Strange things happen in camel sacks, right? Do not say, with whomever it is found, let them die. <laughs> but that's exactly what they say. I just think it's funny how so many things like this are repeated uh, throughout these stories in, in Genesis. The steward mercifully ratchets down their offer. They said, with whomever it's found, let him die, and we will be your servants. The steward says, with he whom it is found, let him be my slave, and the rest of you shall be innocent. The cup is found with Benjamin, and you can only imagine the horror of the brothers. So they're brought back to Joseph, and now Judah steps up. Now remember, the last thing that Joseph would have heard Judah say, his memory of Judah would have been to hear this. What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him, for he is our own flesh. Come, let us sell him, for he is our own flesh. But what profit is it us? Why kill him when we could sell him and make money off of him? What cruelty. But now this Judah, a different Judah, Steps up. Same man, but different heart, I think. Judah says in 44.16, What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. The, the brothers have reached bottom as they feared, and they are undone. Judah confesses their iniquity, and perhaps Judah, in his mind, is thinking more of their sin in selling Joseph than he is of stealing the silver cup, which they didn't actually do. And he offers them all up for slaves. Joseph, again, mercifully ratchets down their offer and says, The man in whose possession the cup has been found, he shall be my slave. The rest of you shall go free. In peace to your father. But Judah still has a problem because Judah has placed his life, as he says, as surety for Benjamin's life. So Judah knows that if Benjamin, goes, uh, that if Benjamin is kept in Egypt, then it will bring down their father to the grave in sorrow. And so he makes this impassioned, noble speech that we read before the service, and he unwittingly makes the strongest argument he possibly could have made to Joseph, the brother who loved his father. Right, That if we do this, if you keep Benjamin, it will bring down our father with sorrow to the grave. And now Joseph is undone. And so we read in chapter 45, verses 1 through 3, Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood before him. And he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer them, for they were dismayed at his presence. Joseph wept. Why did Joseph weep? These were the men who sold him into slavery. Why does Joseph weep? Tears of pain, perhaps? 
He remembered all his affliction. Tears of reunion. They are still family after all. Tears of joy. Maybe remembrance of the old times and that his father is still alive. Tears of thankfulness that the Lord, the Lord has turned his joy into laughter. But the trigger is Judah. It is Judah who formerly was only interested in 20 shekels at the expense of his brother's entire life. This Judah has now offered his own life to save someone else's, to save Benjamin's and his father's. And I think Joseph is moved by that. So Joseph continues and says to his brothers, verse 4, Please come closer to me. And they come closer. And he said, I am your brother Egypt, whom you sold into Egypt. This next text is shocking. This is the, this is the miracle. This is something which I did not expect to see in the text. You know it if you know the story. Perhaps it's become familiar. But it should shock us if we think about what's happened here. Joseph says, Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. What just happened here? We get upset if we, someone we've just met disagrees with us on something that matters to us. Or if someone pulls into our lane that we bought and paid for with our tax dollars. When we feel slighted by someone that we've known for a few years, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, into a life of affliction. And he's had 10 or 20 years to ruminate on it. What do you expect to come out of the heart of a man who's been sold into slavery by his brothers and now those brothers are standing before him and he has all power over their lives? Joseph is in the place that every bitter self-avenger desires to be in. His brothers are groveling before him, and he literally can inflict on them any torment that he wishes. But we don't see that. He was not bitter or angry toward his brothers at all. In fact, he meets them with comfort, and he's more concerned with them than he is with himself. Do you think that Joseph had to go pray for a month and fast in order to be able to forgive his brothers? Did he take a class on anger management? Go to a 12-step program? We don't see any of that, right? Somehow God has done this miracle in, in Joseph's life. Now you may object that Joseph had many months between his brother's first coming and their second coming, um, and, and that at first he did indeed speak roughly to them, and he did test them. But you see, he tested them, but... There was kindness even in his tests. He returned all their money in their sacks. He could have literally killed them, but instead he killed them with kindness. Joseph has not cultivated a heart of bitterness. He was not stoic either. He didn't just accept these circumstances with resignation. We don't hear him saying, well, that's all just water under the bridge. They're dead to me now. I'm moving on with my life. No, he meets them instead with comfort. He's the one who's been injured, but he's concerned that they will be discomforted. He is not consumed with justice, but with mercy. So Joseph meets his brothers in a spirit of compassion and forgiveness and comfort. He does the impossible. He loves his enemies. So what I want to do this morning is ask six questions to help us understand how does this happen in a person's life? How does it happen in Joseph's life? And I hope we can find some things in there that we can learn from as well. And I think some of these questions, especially the first one, will make it even more remarkable, which is, what did Joseph not have? What things did he not have that we do have that might help us? Well, Joseph did not have the Scriptures. He did not have the written law of God. Didn't have children's storybooks about Jesus. Didn't have the parable of the two debtors. 
didn't have the stories of Jesus forgiving his enemies on the cross. Joseph didn't have any of that. And yet, God does this work in his heart. Joseph didn't have any pastors, no counselors he could go to who could help him deal with his bitterness. He didn't have worship services like the one that you're in to go to. He didn't have fellowship. Fellowship requires fellows. At this point in history, the entire nation of Israel consists of 13 men and their families. Jacob, Joseph, and his brothers who sold him into slavery. That would have been his fellowship, but they were all in Canaan anyway. So how remarkable that without any of these things that we rely on, that Joseph has still come to this place of forgiveness in his heart. The second question then, what did Joseph have? He did have the law of God written on his heart, as we all have, to love God and to love neighbor. Our consciences teach us that. Romans 1 tells us that everyone in the world has this written on their heart. And we can see something of this in his refusal of Mrs. Potiphar, because he says, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He also had the legacy of his father and great grandfather and great grandfather. Although he might have misinterpreted that legacy because God had shown his favor upon Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a very different way. You see, Abraham had become a great man with a great household. He had many flocks and herds. So lots of sheep and cows, riches. Isaac, same thing, had so many flocks and herds that he could not even dwell with the Philistines in their land. And they had to divvy up the wells and live in two separate lands because so great were his sheep and cows. And then Jacob, when he went to serve Uncle Laban, came away with so many sheep and cows that he had to divide them into two companies to cross the River Jordan. So Joseph might have reasoned, following God is good. I'm going to get sheep and cows. Right? But we don't... He might have reasoned that. I don't think so. But we know that God had a much harder path for Joseph, didn't he? So the third thing that Joseph did have was a lot of trouble, a lot of affliction. But with that affliction, he had some knowledge of God's favor as well, some assurance of God's favor. In the house of Potiphar, we read that Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. And likewise, in prison, even in prison, it says the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. So Joseph had trial. Yes, he did. But in that trial, he also had some sweet tokens of the Lord's favor on his life. Joseph also had a relationship with God. God's spirit was in Joseph. God's eye was on Joseph. That's why God blessed what Joseph did. And likewise, Joseph kept his eye on God. Joseph said, how can I do this wickedness and sin against God? There was a relationship there. In 39.2, we read that in Potiphar's house, the Lord was with Joseph. And I think we don't, we don't need to, to think that that was only a reference to the material blessing. But no, that the Lord's Spirit was with him, his presence as well. And in the prison, even more poignant, it says, The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. That's what it says in the ESV. This word for steadfast love there is hesed. It's that beautiful Hebrew word for God's inexpressible loving kindness, mercy, and covenant love that he shows to his children. 
Joseph saw that. He knew something of God's chesed, his steadfast love, even in prison. The Lord is with him. And even the king, Pharaoh, recognizes this because Pharaoh says, who can we find like this in whom is a divine spirit? I think the king actually said more than he knew. So Joseph had the spirit of God. And if we have the spirit of God, what then flows out of us? Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. So even though Joseph didn't have all these other helps that we have, the Spirit of God produced in him these fruits. Joseph had one more thing, and that was a promise. When Joseph told his father and mother about the dream where the sun, moon, and stars were bowing to him, his brothers blew it off. But his father, it says, Jacob kept this saying in mind. Well, If his father kept that saying in mind, how much more would have Joseph kept it in mind? And so Joseph, all these years in Potiphar's house, in prison, Joseph would have been thinking, but I had those dreams, and the Lord is doing something here. The Lord is doing something. He had a promise. So third question then, what did Joseph believe? Well, in 45.7, we read it pretty clearly. It said, God sent me before you. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. So Joseph believed that God is sovereign. God sent me before you. He superintended their evil. While not being the author of their evil, God turned it to a good purpose and God saw all of that indeed planned for all of this to happen. Joseph believed that. And secondly, Joseph believed that God is merciful. See, he had seen God's mercy, his hesed in prison. He'd also heard it, perhaps, from his father Jacob. Jacob said when he was praying to the Lord as he's about to enter and and the night where he's going to meet Esau the next day and he's very fearful coming back from the house of Laban, Jacob says to the Lord, with my staff only I cross this Jordan And now I have become two companies. I am unworthy of all the hesed and of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. So Joseph might have learned of that merciful God through Jacob as well. Joseph knew that God was sovereign, that he is in control, and that he is merciful. And then out of that knowledge, he demonstrates mercy toward his brothers. How was Joseph able to do this then? Fourth question, what did Joseph purpose in his heart as a result of this belief? Or whom to, did, to whom did Joseph entrust himself? To use the language of 1 Peter 2.23, Joseph kept entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This is why I think we have no record of bitterness toward his brothers, towards Potiphar, towards the king's cupbearer who forgot him after he was restored to office. If anything, it would have been towards his brothers primarily. They were the first cause of all of this. But when Pharaoh's house learned that his brothers had come, they rejoiced. They were pleased. Which makes you wonder, did Joseph ever tell them how he got to Egypt? Did he ever tell them that his brothers had sold him into slavery and that's why he was there in the first place? If he had, I think they might not have been so pleased. They're glad to have Joseph, of course, but they might have been rather put out with his brothers. You did what? But Joseph had long ago settled these issues in his heart. And we know that he wasn't hanging on to bitterness because he names his children Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh means forgetting, because God made him to forget all his affliction. And Ephraim means fruitful, because God made him fruitful in the land of his affliction. He didn't name his child Merah, like someone else did later in the Old Testament, which means bitterness. No, he made forgotten and fruitful. 
So he's put off bitterness. He's found contentment because he believed that God is sovereign and that God is merciful. And he committed himself to him. God is whom he is looking at. God, he's looking for future favor. He's looking, to borrow Piper's words, for future grace to come from God himself, not from the men around him. He feared God. He tells his brothers that when they first come. Do this, for I fear God. So, as Joseph entrusted himself to God, God then did what only God can do. And he led Joseph on what I would call a highly improbable path. Have you ever had a highly improbable path in your life? I've had a few where I can look back only years later and say, ah, now I see what God was doing there. Do you know, brothers, God sent me to Peru from Georgia to bring me to Southside Bible Church in Colorado. It's a highly improbable path. But I believe that that's exactly what he did, and he did it for a purpose. Joseph, can you imagine the moment when he sees his brothers for the first time? He recognizes them, and it says in the text, Joseph remembered the dreams that he had. And so Joseph sees his brothers, and at once he realizes, God did this. Because God gave me that dream that my brothers were going to be bowing down to me years ago. And now they are here bowing down to me. Joseph must have realized in an instant, God did all of this. God planned all of this. What a, what a marvelous thing. He realizes that all of his suffering has been for this moment for him to be able to save his father and his brother's family alive. Joseph had done what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tell us to do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Or Psalm 37 as well, also verses 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. This is the moment of Joseph's vindication, where what we read about in Psalm 37, 6 happens to him. By the way, if you're having trouble with politics in the election, I commend to you Psalm 37. It's a very good psalm for our spirits in these days. Now, I've been a little careless in this, in this question, saying, Joseph feared God, Joseph trusted God. So you might say, well, which is it? Well, I'm being careless on purpose because fear and trust are corollaries. We fear what we trust, and we trust what we fear. So if you have great hopes of an independent, uh, financially independent retirement, and you've invested heavily in the stock market to that end, then you're going to fear every significant drop in the stock market because your whole future is on the line. Right? That's where you're putting your trust. Or perhaps you've been preoccupied for the last few months with the presidential election, and you've been very fearful as to who will win. Where does that reveal that your trust is? Joseph feared God, and he trusted God. And more striking, even Joseph's steward has become a God-fearer, for he tells the men, be at ease, do not be afraid, your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks, but then he makes himself part of that God plan and says, I had your money. Fascinating. All right, so our fourth question was, what did uh, Joseph purpose in his heart? And it was entrusting himself to God. And then what came out of that then? Fifthly, what did Joseph do? This is where it gets real, brothers. He forgave his enemies. Joseph had the mindset of 1 Corinthians 6-7. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he says, actually then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? See, Joseph was willing to be wronged, specifically for the sake of the good that would come to those who wronged him. This is a rare spirit. I struggle with this spirit. Do you struggle with this spirit? 
This is a rare spirit. This has not come out of the flesh. This is the spirit of God at work. Joseph says, God put me through this suffering. Slavery, false accusations, imprisonment being forgotten to preserve a remnant for you. And I'm okay with that because God did it. God who is greater to me than all the injustice I have suffered. God who has showed mercy to me and therefore it is my pleasure to be like him and to show mercy to you. Like Joseph, you may someday find yourself in prison, unjustly. You may find yourself mistreated by unjust men. But like Joseph, with the Spirit of God, you may also be willing to be wronged for the sake of their eternal souls. Joseph had the big picture, see? God sent me before you to preserve a remnant. This remnant would ultimately be the line of Christ, from which Christ himself would be born. So Joseph viewed himself as an expendable pawn in God's bigger picture. And so he did not give his brothers what they deserved. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay, not us. But what's remarkable here is that even God did not repay vengeance on the brothers. They did deserve death. They were guilty of the sin of man-stealing. They kidnapped him and sold him. But instead, God gave them life. So Joseph forgave his enemies, and he secondly loved his enemies. How does he show this? By meeting them with comfort. His servant met them with comfort. Do you think his servant had learned this grace from Joseph? I think he had. I think there was a sweet climate of grace in the household of Joseph in the court of Pharaoh that even his servants had picked up on it. And interestingly, Joseph forgave them even though they never confessed their sin directly to him. They never said, Joseph, we, we bad. <laughs> we, we did you wrong. They never say that directly. Judah confesses their iniquity generally, not knowing who it is, but we never have a record that they came to Joseph and said, we're sorry that we did what we did. But Joseph forgave them anyway because he had a spirit that was ready to forgive before they even opened their mouths. So summarizing these five questions, how was Joseph able to love his brothers? He had limited but accurate knowledge of God, the sovereign, merciful God. He was in relationship with God. He had entrusted himself to him. We could say that Joseph knew God. And like Daniel, who would later say, the people who know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Joseph, indeed, was a very strong man. And then sixthly, what was the result of all this? Well, it was peace with God. Hence, Ephraim and Manasseh forgotten and fruitful. Joseph didn't have these torments in his mind. He didn't have the constant agitation and irritation and fearfulness. No, he was content. Even in prison, even in the house of Potiphar, it would appear, he was content with what the Lord was doing. So he had peace with God and peace with fellow man. The household of Pharaoh respected him greatly. His brothers became reconciled with him as well. Sorry, I've just got to take another sip. Now, this is a hard thing. I want to ask this question. Are you uncomfortable with a God who might send you into slavery so that you could later become the salvation of those who enslaved you. When we talk about God's sovereignty, God's mercy, it all sounds good, but when we apply it to our lives, this is hard, isn't it? It's hard to accept such a God who is so merciful that he calls his children to suffer so that his enemies might also become children. 
The prophet Jonah struggled with that. But that's where we have an advantage of hindsight that Joseph didn't have, which makes what Joseph did even more remarkable, I think. Because what we know, looking back 2,000 years in history, is that God suffered for us first. God the Father sent his most cherished son, his only son, God the Son, to endure the greatest injustice in the history of the world. An innocent man condemned to die on a cruel Roman cross. And for what purpose did he do that? In order to save his enemies. And we have met the enemies, and they are us. He suffered first for our sakes. God does not ask us to do anything that he himself has not already done. Joseph didn't have that advantage. He didn't know that was coming, but we do. So we know a more full character picture of God, that God not only is sovereign and merciful, but that he's so merciful that like Judah, he's willing to sacrifice even his own life for the sake of his enemies. Who was Joseph like then, as we look forward in Scripture? Who else gave up his own rights? Who left the Father's presence and fellowship with the Father at the right hand of God to descend to earth and live among sinful men? 33 years of difficult existence among sinners. Who else kept entrusting himself to him who judges justly? Who else prayed while he was being condemned on the Roman cross? For God to forgive his enemies? Who else viewed himself as expendable in God's bigger picture for the ultimate good of his enemies? Who else was given up for dead only to rise and to become the salvation of God's chosen people? Joseph is a beautiful picture of Jesus. The spirit of Joseph is the spirit of Jesus. But in Jesus, It's even greater because now it's God himself who is doing these things for us. But it didn't stop there. As we learn from the apostles, right, we hear the echoes and the things that they say of this spirit as well. What does the apostle Paul say? I have learned in all things to be content. No bitterness. I could wish myself accursed for the sake of my kinsmen. He loves his brother's of ethnic Israel so much that he wishes himself accursed for their sakes. Or as Logan preached a few weeks ago, 2 Timothy 2.10, for this reason, Paul said, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. As an aside here, do you think that the all things that Paul would have been willing to endure, might have included a facial covering. Like, if somebody came to Paul and said, hey, I hear you guys are having a meeting tonight. We got this little pandemic going on. Um, Would you all just wear a mask? Paul's like, give me five of them, and I'll preach five times as loud as I need to, but through five layers of masks if I need to, so that I can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Am I right? (laughs) I think that's the spirit of Paul. I think that's the spirit of Paul. So we need to be careful when we complain Uh, and when we're bitter about such things in our spirits. What about the rest of the early church? They began selling their property, Acts 2.45, and possessions, and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Hebrews 10.34, they were not only selling their property and giving it, but it says they joyfully accepted the plundering of their property. Now that's not natural. I know that's not natural because I'm not thinking it right now. I'm thinking there's coming restrictions, there's lockdowns. I'm thinking, how dare they tell me? How dare they do this? <laughs> and here, they're just going in and grabbing it. They're coming into the house. They're taking out stuff for the sake of the gospel. And the people said, because it's for the sake of Christ, we accept it joyfully. We accept it joyfully. Matteo preached a few weeks ago on the treasure of great price that was hidden in the field. And so I would ask now, what is expendable for the sake of our treasure? Is our bitterness expendable? Can we put it off? 
against those who have wronged us? What about our personal freedom? Is it expendable for the sake of a greater treasure? Are we willing to be wronged by our brother or sister, by our government, by our employer, by the other party? Or do we have the spirit of defiance that Joseph's brothers had? When Joseph first told them of his dream, they said, are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? In Luke 19, Jesus told a parable in which some servants uh, rebelled against the, the Lord that had been put in place over them. And they said, we will not have this man to rule over us. Now, have you heard anything like that recently on the news? Maybe in your house? Maybe in your heart? That spirit of defiance is not the spirit of Joseph. It's not the spirit of Jesus. And it will lead you to tumult in your soul. Don't put your trust in politics. Entrust yourself instead to a sovereign, merciful God, and you will be rewarded with a contentment, right? Peace with God and peace with man. And God himself will take care of you, whether you are in prison or whether you are in the palace. Early in life, God had foreshadowed to Joseph in dreams that his palace was coming. But we have a more sure word of revelation. Our palace is coming. Our king is coming. We hang on to that hope. The older I get, the shorter my remaining time seems here. So this is easy for me to say, or easier, because I'm already over the hill. (laughs) That the days that are remaining seem short in comparison. I'm going to spend the majority of my future time with the Lord in his presence, not with whatever's going on in earth, right? I look forward to that. You younger ones have a challenge before you to maintain this spirit like Joseph, even when you can't see the end. While we wait for him, then, let us keep entrusting ourselves to him, and then out of that, let us demonstrate his mercy to each other, and even to our enemies. If I think about the one word that best describes the tone of conversation in our day, what you hear on the news, what you see on social media, etc., I would say, and this is on both sides of the political spectrum, that it is merciless. That is the tone. It's merciless. The world is in desperate need of mercy. Where will they see merciful people? And so to my invisible friends also on the live stream, if you have never entrusted yourself to this merciful God, let me just invite you to do that. God himself invites you to do so. Jesus, the Son of God, invited everyone who is weary and heavy laden to come to him and find rest. If you're burdened by bitterness, by the memories of past injustice, or the the spectacle of present injustice in your life, by unforgiveness towards others, by the tumult and uncertainty of our world, by future fears of what is coming. Unburden your heart to the Lord. Confess it to Jesus. Confess your unworthiness to him. Thank him for his self-sacrifice for you and trust your life to him. And then a miracle will happen. God will adopt you as his own son or daughter into his family And you will know the peace and the comfort and the steadiness and the contentment that only the children of God know. We are the children of the Supreme King, brothers and sisters. We don't know what will come. But we know who loves us as his children. We know that he will take care of us, whether we're in the prison or in the palace. So let us entrust ourselves to him and bear out this fruit of mercy. Let's pray. Our merciful Father, we thank you for revealing your truth to us. We thank you for the greatest act of sacrifice which has ever been seen that you did for our sakes. 
submitting yourself even to death on the cross in order that we might have eternal life with you. Father, we thank you for this word that you've given us. We thank you for the example that we have in the life of Joseph. We thank you for what you've shown us here today of your your sovereignty and your mercy. We thank you that we can trust you. We pray that you would help us. It is not easy, Lord. We pray that you would help us, that you would bring your spirit to us, that we might apprehend these things, that we might truly commit ourselves to you as Joseph did, and that you would enable us, Lord, then to demonstrate mercy toward others. We pray that you yourself would continue to be merciful to us, even in this time of tumult, and that you would give us, Lord, what we do not deserve that you would give us mercy and grace. We ask all in Jesus' name, amen.